Tottenham away. We're back from the international break. It's a massive, massive game. It always is, no matter what Spurs fans think about the fixture. We know it's a big fixture. They know it's a big fixture. Let's stop beating around the bush and get down into this preview. Spurs away. We need to get the momentum back. Obviously, Spurs had that minor capitulation against Brighton before the international break after being 2-0 up at halftime, lost 3-2. We're coming back from the international break after a 4-1 defeat against Ipswich. And yeah, we just need to make sure we capitalise on this now. And this is a huge game for Julian Lopetegui and West Ham, not just because it's a London derby, but because of the uh, you know the state of play in the Premier League and where we currently find ourselves in the up and down season we've experienced so far. But let's get into the tactical breakdown of Tottenham Hotspur, how we can look to exploit the gaps that they leave, but also the dangers of Tottenham's pace and possession play that we need to be careful of going to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium this weekend. So if you enjoyed the breakdown, leave a like, subscribe to the channel and yeah, let's get into it. Firstly, let's just do kind of a little bit of an overview as we normally do going into this game of the stats so far in the table. Tottenham currently two points more than us on 10 points compared to our eight. They've scored four more goals than us with 14 compared to our 10. They've conceded just eight goals um, from seven games. We've conceded 11. And you can see there in the position, they are currently ninth and we are a few places below in 12th. If we shift over to the expected stats, it's a slightly different picture. Tottenham should have 13.25 points. We should have 8.43. So yeah, you can see the differences there. They have an XG of 16.84 compared to our 12. They have an XG uh, XG against of 7.85 versus our 14.08. So almost twice as worse our defense so far this season. And you can see there the big discrepancy in the expected position. So Tottenham hypothetically should be sitting in third place right now. Whereas we're kind of on par, we're 12th, but we, we should be 13th. So that's kind of just the overview. The stats, well, the, the, the kind of top level stats suggest that Tottenham are slightly underperforming so far this season. And we're marginally, marginally over, overperforming, but pretty much on baseline. And yeah, I was doing quite a bit of research into Tottenham for this one, which we're going to get into the tactical breakdown of shortly with, you know, screenshots and all of the stuff we normally do. But I thought I'd just give you a, a kind of a high line overview of some of those stats and the way Tottenham plays. So firstly, they're going to play a 4-3-3. They play a base six. So one person at the six and then two eights or number tens either side. Um, this is how we would expect them to line up. Something like this. So Vicario, Poro, Romero, Van der Ven, Udogi at the back. Benton Core as the base six with Kulusevski and Madison as the number two eights or tens. Um, you then got Brennan Johnson on the right, Timo Werner on the left, and Dom Solanke up top. So that's how they kind of set up. They've played 4 3 3 pretty much the whole season. They have also played sort of a 4 2 3 1 with Madison as the number 10. But at the moment, they've they've drifted Kulusevski into that number eight position to accommodate uh, for Johnson on the right hand side, who's been scoring a lot of goals. Timo Werner naturally takes the left hand side. And then Solanke, obviously, the £60 million signing goes up top for them. So, yeah. So far, they've averaged around 63% possession in the Premier League. Uh, they've had one game where they've dropped below 50%, which was against Brentford at home, where they won 3-1. They're averaging around 2.33 expected goals per game, which is pretty high. And their, only, uh, their XG against is around 1.14 per game in the Premier League. So, again, you can see why they're hypothetically uh, in third place in the expected stats table. Uh, they average around 16.14 shots per game. 7.86 uh, shots against. So again, you can see they're pretty much over double there in terms of the shot output versus their opponents. And again, a big one is they are dominating possession. And with that comes a lot of passing stats. And yeah, they're averaging 5 for 1.86 passes per game, whereas their opposition are averaging 3 one passes per game. So that's just the overview. Again, play a 4-3-3 three, three with a base six, like to control possession with passing and dictating the tempo of games where they can. But this is where we get into the nitty gritty of it and where we can exploit Tottenham and some of the things we need to look out for. So firstly, it's just reinforcing the shape that they play. Um, this was against Brighton just one minute into the game. You can see Benton core at the base of that triangle, that yellow triangle. You've then got Kulisewski who operates on the right hand side uh, eight position. Madison on the left-hand side, eight position. And then you've got Dom Solanke at the top of the red dotted line there. So you can see visually how they like to play. Um, you've got the base six. You've got the two tens either side in the pockets. And they're playing pretty close, uh, close to Solanke. With Timo Werner and Brennan Johnson then 
occupying the wider areas outside that. And you can see the dangers. Look, just one minute into the game, what they can do. They can create overloads in the midfield if we can if they can bypass that that first press or line from Brighton. And you can see here Kulusevsky picks up a really nice position between the midfield and defense, which is what Madison and Kulusevsky are really intelligent at doing. And we need to be very careful of that. And then they've got Brennan Johnson and Timo Werner almost creating the overload in the wide areas. So that's something we're going to be have to be massively careful of. With West Ham, we've seen that we haven't been the best at defending in these situations so far this season. I thought we looked a little bit better um, against Ipswich Town, but still a lot of gaps, still a lot of issues defensively and structurally that we need to be careful of. Again, I don't believe we're going to play the same way against Ipswich that we are when we go to Spurs. I think we're going to be a lot more compact and we're going to try and reduce the gaps that Madison, that Kulisewski picks up. And again, we're, we're going to get into a separate video for what our predicted uh, starting 11 will be for West Ham. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be, um, you know, Suchek in there with either Alvarez or Guido Rodriguez. So we're going to look to be a little bit more defensive, a little bit more structured in that midfield, because that is the number one danger right now for Spurs. When Madison and Kulisewski are finding the ball in between the pockets like that, it's a danger and we need to be very careful of it. But it also has its negatives, which we're going to get onto shortly. Um, also with Spurs, they like to invert their fullbacks. Udoki looks like likes to kind of come inside and play in that midfield, similar to what we saw with Chelsea and Cucurella. And then Timo Werner will occupy the left-hand wide space. And uh, on the other side, Poro will do it as well. Um, not as frequently as Udoki, but you can see here an example of it. So Spurs playing out from the back, uh, just two minutes into the game. Poro's gone and occupied a more central position, which then allows Romero to play the channels where Brennan Johnson comes to feet. And Kulisevsky, you can see there, He's already making that drifting move inside to play off the back of the midfield uh, and find the space in behind there. So, yeah, that's what we need to be obviously be careful of um, because A, they've got the inversion. B, they've got the two eights that will occupy the spaces between the lines, which we have to be switched on to. We cannot let Madison and Kulisevsky dictate this game because they'll kill us. They'll absolutely kill us on the ball. Um, and they have the quality to unlock our defence, you know, with Brennan Johnson and Timo Werner and the pace that they have and the space that Dom Solanke will occupy. So there's a lot of good stuff about Spurs this season that we need to be careful of. Obviously, their most impressive performance or win was that game against uh, Man United at Old Trafford. Again, a lot of nuances to that with the red card, but I still think they would have won that game. But in terms of how Spurs sit off uh, or their off-ball shape, this is where I feel like we can get at Spurs. When I've said about the advantages of them playing a lone six and those two eights, number tens. However, there are occasions where they're going to be left very, very isolated. But just so you can see a visual of how they are structurally set up. Again, Poro is just outshot in their back four. They're trying to play that box midfield free with Ben Sikor at the, at the base of that triangle. And then the two forwards, they're almost inside forwards out of possession. So they'll play pretty tight in. So Brennan Johnson and Timo Verde are not really high and wide. They'll start in this position. And then Solanke's at the top of that, uh, of that baseline. So... This is how they like to line up. There's going to be occasions where they play a much higher line than this um, when they're trying to squeeze up the opposition, which we saw last season a lot. Um, but again, that just kind of gives you a visual of how Spurs like to play structurally off the ball. Um, and when Spurs, again, this is where there's issues with the, the way they play. So they're going to try and play this high intensity pressing. So you can see here, Madison sees the trigger to go and uh, attack Brighton's number six here with the press. But if you have a player that is technically good enough to bypass this press, again, James Madison in particular, out of him and Kulisewski, because he's worse defensively. If you can get past that gap, look at the space that you have in transition. I mean, you can create an overload really easily against Spurs just by beating that one press. You know, Madison went in, he got turned by, by the number six Brighton player. And then Brighton go and create an overload on the right-hand side. So... You can see that there are flaws to how Spurs play, which is probably what led to their demise in the second half against Brighton. You know, they were trying to continuously play this way. The risk versus reward worked in the first half, but in the second half, they just got torn apart by playing the same way and they didn't change it. And that's something I think Postacoglu, for a lot of the good stuff he's doing at Tottenham, that stubbornness, you can't, you can't be successful in the Premier League. You have to adapt to different scenarios. That was a moment where he could have brought in Basuma to play alongside Benson Core and just shut off those areas. But they continue to play the same way. And the longer the game goes, the more expansive it gets, the tired, the more tired the players will get. And the gaps just get bigger. 
and you can see here again, I mean, this was in the first half. They're one nil up in this situation. You can see how Spurs like to press if it's a goal kick or the goalkeeper has the ball. Solanke goes in. Timo Werner's touch, uh, touch tight on that uh, ready-to-trigger dunk on the other side. Then you've got Madison and Kulisewski have come into the two Brighton midfielders. And then Brennan Johnson is just occupying this space on the right-hand side. But again, all you have to do to bypass this is one ball in behind from the goalkeeper or, or you know, a, a long ball. Look at the space in between the defence and midfield after this happens. You know, it's very disjointed by Spurs in this situation. That space is unbelievable. And again, it was the type of game that it was and it continued in this vein. But the way Spurs play with that base six and Ad Madison and Kulusevsi, who are naturally more attack minded, this is where the space uh, will, will, will kind of pick up for West Ham. And this is going to be a massive part of our success at Tottenham Hotspur if we get something from this game. It's going to be in this transition area here when Spurs have pressed us high and we're going to have to be brave. We're going to have to be brave in these moments on the ball. Recognise when to go long because there will be situations like this. But if we can find players like Kudus and Bowen and occupy those spaces in between their midfield and defence in these situations, we have a very, very good chance of getting in on the transition. And also Spurs play that high line naturally. So there's going to be that space or discrepancy between the space that we can attack. So... That's definitely an area we should be looking to to kind of get into. Um, again, just reiterating the high line here and how it can actually be quite ineffective or effective at the same time. So there's the risk versus the reward factor that comes with this, right? So you see it's circled, it's circled in the middle, Benton core, pretty isolated as the lone six. You've got Kudusevsky and Madison playing quite, you know, 10 yards in front of him. And then you've got that back four of Spurs that are playing very high, trying to stay, trying to squeeze Brighton as much as they can. But A, it leaves a lot of space in behind if if you do break beat that press or high line with a long ball over the top. But also it does lead to a disjointed recovery from Spurs and it happens quite a lot. So again, you'll see it here. They've played one pass onto the left-hand side. They found Matoma inside here. And then you can see Madison and Kulusevski, what we're in the 57th minute now. They're not wanting to do the tracking back right now. They're 2-1, you know, Brighton have got their tails up and they're just not... They're just not recovering. And because Spurs played the high line, they're naturally playing higher up the pitch anyway, out of possession. But when you get into this area and Spurs are forced to drop, drop back, it becomes a little bit disjointed. And then it starts to open those spaces up for you to kind of play through. And Brighton actually scored from that high line press initially from Spurs. So again, you can see that there's positives to both of what Ange Postacoglu is trying to do at Tottenham, but there's also negatives. And that's what we have to capitalize on at the weekend against Spurs because defensively, I feel like, again, they've only conceded, what, eight goals this season, but it could have been more. It could have been more. And I I just think we have the players, if we set up correctly and we're structurally very, very tight in, in the midfield, in the midfield spaces, and we stop Madison and Kulusevski getting on the ball constantly, I just believe we have the quality to go to Spurs and hurt them, uh, especially in these transition periods. So, one thing we also need to be careful of on our side is Spurs' pace and how much they can hurt you as well. And when they're fluid and when they're playing, it's very difficult to disrupt that. And you can see here the as soon as what this was, I think this was Tottenham's first goal against Brighton at the weekend. The ball goes in, they turn it over quite high up the pitch. The ball gets fired into Solanke. And the two the two wide players in Timo Werner and Brennan Johnson, they're automatically triggered to just make that run in behind, you know, between fullback and centre back where possible or outside of fullback. Brennan Johnson, who's been in fantastic form since he's, you know, experienced quite a lot of criticism from the Spurs fan base, he's scoring goals and he's a goal scorer and he's someone that is more of a forward than a, you know, a creative wide player. Same with Timo Werner, you know, not a creative player, but he's a he's more of a I would I would argue argue he's a striker playing out on the left-hand side. And you could even say the same for Brennan Johnson. So naturally, these players, their instinct is to run in behind when they smell danger like this. And again, this has been coached into them to make that darting run as soon as Solanke receives the ball to give the Brighton defence something to think about. This is where Wambasaka and Emerson are going to have to be switched on at the weekend. And we've seen that they both have a tendency to switch off. If they do, they'll get into this position and Spurs will score, um, which as they did against Brighton. So... We have to be careful in these moments. And I think that's the two areas where if we're switched on to this, we we can get a result at Tottenham. Number one, stopping Madison and Kulisewski playing in between the lines. So 
the midfield three of West Ham are going to have to be switched on defensively and alert to those situations and stop those stop Madison and Kulisevsi picking up the ball as frequently as possible. Again, there's going to be occasions where they do that because they're very intelligent and quality players, but we have to shut off that space as best we can when we're out of possession and we can't leave ourselves isolated like we have done in a few games this season, as have Spurs done in a few games this season. So that's kind of number one. And number two is, again, our fullbacks are going to have to have an absolutely fantastic game, to be honest with you, because I don't particularly rate Johnson and Werner's quality, uh, you know, in terms of when you're looking at other wingers in the Premier League or forwards. I don't think they're completely, you know, I don't, I wouldn't put them in a Champions League team, as uh, for example, or a Premier League title chasing team. They're not going to move the needle in that way, but they have a lot of pace and they have a lot of, you know, directness that again we said we said just there when they when they scored that goal they're more they're more strikers than than wide creators so they're going to look to make those darting runs inside or behind wamba saka and emerson have been to be honest susceptible to switching off and allowing that sort of thing to happen i think wamba saka we know naturally it's been throughout his career he's his tendency to switch off and in those situations where you feel like you've got you know a couple of seconds breather and then bang they're in behind you can't do that in this game at all. Same with Emerson. I think this season, his effort and performances haven't been to the standard they were at, especially at the start of last season. You know, crosses have been way too easy to come in from Emerson's side. Hasn't been tracking runners as much as he should. He's going to have to do that against Brennan Johnson because he'll kill him in transition and will we'll get caught out. And then you're relying on Tadebo and Kilman to bail you out if they do get in behind, which is a massive task because they're going to have their own personal battle against Dom Solanke, who we know is a very good striker. Do I think he's worth 60, 65 million pounds? Absolutely not. But that's the way of the market. That's the way of an English striker in the Premier League. That's what it's going to cost you these days. And I don't particularly rate Tottenham's recruitment so far. You know, the, the money they've spent this summer on the likes of Timo Werner and Solanke and even Brennan Johnson. I feel like there were better players and better recruitment options out there. But it's still effective the way Ange Postacoglu wants to play this high intensity, high press, high risk high reward football and we're going to have to be very switched on to it so from a West Ham perspective our main areas again I've said defensively where we need to be careful I think Tadebo and Kilman they're starting to form a nice partnership and you know the more games they play together the more solid they're going to look we haven't really had a settled back four for that long you know when you're thinking of Wambasaka, Emerson, Tadebo, Kilman they haven't played that many minutes together so the more it happens the more obviously accustomed they're going to get to each other and I just think it's so important for the consistency of our season that the base and you know the the base of our team and the structure of our team stays intact wherever possible. You know we can't be chopping and changing, changing our centre backs, the goalkeeper, the holding midfield number six, uh, and even the striker. I would say those four positions, four or five positions, they're who you're looking at to be regular starters in a football team. Again, you can rotate wide players and you know number eights, number tens, and you know, those sort of positions can adjust and you'd feel less of an effect in the team. When we're constantly changing these key positions and these core positions in the squad and starting 11, it's going to have that negative impact because you're just not settled. You're not accustomed to it, you know. So I think we're gradually getting there. I think with Lopetegui, I've said it before, I'm going to give him 15 to 20 games before I even, you know, start to properly judge him or assess him. There's areas of what Lopetegui's doing so far that I like. There's also areas that I dislike. And again, we're going to have to see over time how that kind of fills out. When I'm recording this, I'm not sure if Nicholas Fulcrook's going to be fit, but I think even if he was, there's no way you can drop Antonio after his performance against Ipswich. And we know Antonio's record against Spurs is pretty good. So there's also that to factor in. But yeah, we'll do a predicted uh, lineup in a separate video for West Ham for this game. But yeah, we're going to have to be pretty on it in this game. It's going to be a very, very tough test for West Ham, but we're now going into a period coming off the back of that international break where we've got four really critical games. Number one, Spurs away. Number two, Man United at home. Number three, Forest away. Number four, Everton at home. And then we've got another international break. So we're going to have to be on it. You know, we can't really afford to be looking at games and saying, you know, it's a, we do our best. If we get points, we get points. It's not how the Premier League works now. I think bar Man City and Arsenal, really, those two games, you're thinking it's almost a free hit because those two are naturally the forefront leaders of the Premier League. But when you're looking at teams like Spurs, they can drop points. And I just think we have enough 
in our ranks, in our capabilities to to cause uh, you know Spurs some damage. We obviously won their last season two one, which uh, was definitely a snatch and grab uh, performance. But again, Spurs weren't the best. And I just think we, with Kudus and Bowen, and if Antonio is playing like he did against Ipswich, we have enough to disrupt that Spurs back line, especially in transitions. And Benton Court at the base six, he's a good player, but there's there's vulnerabilities there. And because Madison and Kuliseski, as I mentioned, they're more attack minded players. That's where we get at Spurs. Those spaces in between the midfield and defence, when when we beat that press or when we transition of a turnover in our third of the pitch, that's when Kudus and Bowen are going to have to be electric and we're going to have to take our chances because as we saw with the stats at the start, you know, Spurs, you know, average, what, 16 shots per game, only concede seven. You know, they're going to have, what, 60, 65% of the ball, I would expect, quite easily. Um, and then, yeah, they're obviously going to try and dominate and dictate the tempo of the game through Madison and Kulisevsky, which we cannot allow to happen. So lots of positives to go into this, lots of areas to be not concerned of, but cautious of going into this. It's always a massive game against Spurs, this London derby. Hopefully we can go into it with the mindset of, you know, we're going there to win. We're not just going there to try and get something or, you know, play a free hit because no way should it be that type of game. And yeah, in terms of my prediction, tough to predict this game. I think I'm going to go with 2-2. I think both defences have shown their frailties. And I think the way stylistically this game is going to shape up, I think we're going to score at least a couple of goals. But I also think we'll probably concede one or two. So again, either team might edge it 2-1, but I'm going to go 2 all. Um, I think that would be a solid point away from home. Again, we should be going for all three points, but... You know, a two-all draw away at Spurs wouldn't be the worst result in the world. So I'm going to go with two-all. Um, let me know down below in the comments what you think. What's your score predictions for this London derby against Tottenham at the weekend? What are your concerns? What do you think about the tactics behind it? And yeah, what should we be looking to capitalise on when we go to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium this weekend? So yeah, any comments, leave them down below. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed this breakdown. Subscribe to the channel for more content. And until the next one, come on you irons. Thank <laughs> you.